Yeah, well, I think there's a lot of potential here in Brazil. I mean, obviously, there's a natural talent here. Uh, there's create, creative people. It's a very creative and dynamic culture. And I think some of the most famous aspects of the culture in Brazil are loved around the world. Things like Carnival, things like the Amazonian jungle. People are fascinated by the creatures and stories uh, and the people of those places. So I think there's lots that's very natural about Brazil for global filmmaking. I mean, to me, that's the, that's the big issue is that that filmmaking is done all over the world and there's films made by communities and cultures and every language but what people think about when they talk about movies in general is the Hollywood style so to me the big opportunity is partnering is taking Hollywood folks like myself and partnering with the local talent and using local ideas or Brazilian style or Brazilian attitude or Brazilian design to create a truly international film and I think that's the a, a tremendous potential there to actually create images that and st tell stories that make Make people think of what Brazil is, just do it in a Hollywood style. See, like he said, the thing is why Brazil has a really, really good opportunity here is that, like he said, we are so swamped with Hollywood ideals that our public and the masses of the world are looking for something new. And this is like a gold mine. There's a gold mine because people here think differently, people here create differently. So there's designs here, there's there's culture here that we're not familiar as North Americans with, and we're eager to see new things. So all we have to do, like he says, is bring in some of the strategy levels of United States into here so we are able to accept it, but then bring the culture and the art of Brazil to the populace, and then that's where we're going to succeed. Yeah, that, that's the eternal question, is, is how do you make something new and fresh? I mean, I, I think uh, as a creative person, you realize that almost everything has been done in some form. Every, every story's been told, sort of. Everything, there's been creative minds since the dawn of time. So to me, it's all about making it fresh, making it feel new, bringing something to the table that people haven't seen or don't remember seeing. Uh, and I, actually, that's, I think, part of the sort of, possibility of Brazil is that I think the the visual culture here the style the ideas the places the faces the names haven't been seen as much in, in let's call it global filmmaking so uh, there's a lot of the freshness that Brazil has to offer that I think is uh, what people are looking for I mean really it's it's uh, in Hollywood it's like the you know the fresh face the hot new thing it's whatever gets people talking about it so uh, I just think there's lots of stuff here that just hasn't been exposed as widely and 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 now is the time to do it see I think it's easy for to come up with new things because in Hollywood and in the world you have trends and people follow trends and the trends all stem from things that happened in the past so like he said there's nothing really original there's just changes in the originality as it goes through loops so what we need to do is find things that are not popular because they're unseen which is why we're in Brazil we grab things that are unseen from Brazil and we look at the trends that are happening and we add it to the next trend so we become pioneers of the next trend and that's how you make things that are that the populace think that are new and creative based on old formulas mixed in with new trends. Yeah, that's, that's an age-old question. When I first started doing uh, computer animation and when it began to become a significant idea in the filmmaking world. So, for example, I worked on movies like The Abyss and Terminator 2. But when Jurassic Park came out and we made living, breathing dinosaurs, it, uh, people's minds exploded in Hollywood. And all of a sudden, everybody began talking about things like, how will you do synthetic actors, living actors? Can we, should we digitize Arnold Schwarzenegger before he gets any older so we can have him forever? And I remember being on a panel at the DGA where I was supposed to be the one defending the idea of digital actors and, and, and Tom Cruise stood up and said, you have no right to dig digitize my image and recreate me. I am, you know, and I went, I, I don't want to do anything to you. I just, I, I, I do believe that, that the possibility of creating lifelike characters using computers is definitely there. And it will eventually happen that we can create a digital character that no one can tell is not actually living and breathing. 
Um, however, I still do think that there's something, there's sort of this sort of uncanny, this sort of unexplainable thing that makes human beings special. I mean, what makes a great actor a great actor? It's all these things that you can't really define, these, uh, these sort of unknowns. So I, I don't really ever expect that we will, let's say, get rid of actors or get rid of people. You could have computers write scripts. People have tried that. You could have computers try to do everything, but there's something about the human creative process that you cannot reduce to a, to a computer, at least not yet. And so I feel the same way about actors. I mean, another thing I often tell people is computer animators are the actors. Even though they might be using a, a, an electric pen or a computer mouse to draw on the screen or to move characters, in essence, they're, they're acting. Their mind is interpreting the movement, behavior, and performance, and they're using a computer to execute it. So even today, you still have this human aspect, this human creative ability that brings whatever it is to life, whether it be a monster or a cartoon person. Um, still, it requires this human creative input. So I, I never really expect, a, at least in my lifetime, to have movies that are completely done by a computer that don't require the human creative aspect. And I mean that in, in every single as every single part of making a movie. Yeah, see, I agree with him because no matter how much you design or how much you create something that's digital, for, say, for example, Gollum, King Kong, all those were based on somebody filming another person and that person acting. Because with the acting of real life, you get the, you get the spontaneity of the unknown. The, you, get, you have a person, he decides, I'm going to put a little bit of this right on the spot. When you're doing it digitized, you're thinking too much of how I'm going to act, how I'm going to do this, and you don't get the mistakes, you don't get the little nuances. So I don't think we're ever going to get away from that because that is what brings in the life to even the digital form, is the little quirkinesses of things. And you can't really, even when you're doing digital stuff, you can bring that in, but it's not the same as watching somebody naturally acting it out. And even though if we do go to digital, we will always follow somebody, film somebody, and do it, and then replicate it. So I never thought of actors going to be completely obsolete. There's no way, because we still want certain personalities, too. So you want, like, the Al Pacino personality. You're not going to recreate a personality, I mean, an Al Pacino guy without an Al Pacino guy. So you still need these people that we can see and we can interact and talk to on a daily basis. You know, I want to add one thing. He's reminded me of something that I struggle with is I do both live, I direct live action movies and animated movies. And I've been through this process where I try to make the animated films more like live action. And when you work with real people and the physical world, it, it, it constrains you. You have to react and deal with reality. So the sun's going down. Oh, the actor is not feeling that well today. Um, oh, this line that we thought was so funny on the page is not funny at all to watch. You have to deal with the with this kind of unexplainable, let's call it accidents or 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 things that you didn't realize until it's actually occurring. So when you're making live action movies, it's a very different flavor than animated films. Animated films are in some sense completely preconceived. They're completely planned because to execute even a three second shot may take days of time. It's a very different process. And what I always tried to do with my animated crews, I try to treat them like it's a live action process. You get in the room, you talk about it, you act it out together, and, you, and I try to respond that way. But the problem is the process is so technically complicated. At some point, once you commit and you've gone to the next step, and you go, oh man, it's not funny, to unwind it and redo it, can be very expensive and take a lot of time. So there's something about, uh, the reason why I say that is I feel like digital filmmaking and animated films in particular will eventually evolve to where the process itself can be more interactive in real time and become more uh, like live action filmmaking where you're reacting just like good actors listens to the other actor, they listen to each other. There's a good director. You watch and you listen. You pay attention, and you are you you have an image of what you want, and you but your your actors are the instrument through which your idea comes to life. As a director, you can't do everything, and you have to understand how to get the most out of the people you're working with: wardrobe designers, uh, set painters, uh, prop builders. Every one of those people are you. You are getting the creative process through them. You know, there's a, there's a saying that was done by um, a famous filmmaker artist that I really, really, uh, really loved. And his, his saying was, uh, it was uh, Jean Cocteau. And he used to say, filmmaking will never be a true art form. 
until it is as, as accessible as pen and paper. Because he realized that as a director, he because he was also a traditional artist as a painter, he, he and, and various other things. He realized that as a director, it was an army he was he was commanding. And in fact, even if he didn't like the way that the wall was painted, he didn't have the time to actually personally paint it. And even if he didn't like how the actor behaved, he himself couldn't perform that role. So there's an interesting thing about live action movies that really makes it a dynamic, unexpected process. And, and animation, even though it's currently so complex, is very, very preconceived. I, I, I long for the, uh, the day in which the whole process can be more interactive and more real time so that it can have this sort of unexpected outcome like live action films. I think that the uh, future, the future is going to be a combination of the both because as we develop in technology we're going to have the ability to create our characters digitally and do it before we even have the actor and then we're going to have an actor real time acting it out and making that person that character so we'll get to a point that we'll be able somebody will be able to walk around and people will see that person not as that person but as a digital form of anything so say that you're walking around in the future I believe that you will be Bugs Bunny so you'll be doing everything that Bugs does but people don't see you as you people see you as Bugs Bunny but you'll have that still richness and feel of natural because it'll be a real person and then we can have the ability afterwards to tweak it a little bit if we don't like something that's going on with the actor so I think it's going to be a combination of the both. Yeah, you want a future, the future is good. In fact, eventually we get digital. This is something, you know, I used to talk about. I used to be a proselytizer. I would go out and preach about digital filmmaking. But for example, another thing you can think about is you could make an you could make a digital character, and you could somehow define him so precisely he could speak in any language. He could also give a performance to you that could be G-rated or R-rated. Just think about that. Anyway. They could, they could tell that was a strong topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, because th this, uh, uh, yeah. No, I, I get ex I get this all the time, too. Th this comes up when you work on like big... Fear or something. <laughs> well, when you work on really big movies, they generally call them like four quadrant. There's all these terms that people use. But basically, it generally needs to be PG-13. It can't be R. Because you want it to be viewable by the largest possible audience. You want it to appeal to parents teenagers and even allow them to bring their young children if they're a popular fan. You don't want to make a movie that has to, that requires you to be 18 years or older. That means you're limiting your potential box office and, and studios are businesses. So when you're working on these big exciting movies that we all love to work on because they give you, you're, you're, you're just doing the best work and working with the best people in the world but the final product has these very strong constraints. So what if you could make a digital movie you could turn a button. Here's the PG-13 version. Oh, here's the R version. Oh, here's the G version. That, that, that is a really exciting idea, and I've talked about this with many people over the years. We're far from that. That's way too complex right now. But there's some potential there with, with digital filmmaking to allow you to do that. We almost can do that with Blu-rays, like extended version and stuff like that. That'll be the next step, basically, is going, oh, do I want to play the R-rated, the PG-rated? It'll just be like an edited thing. But like he was saying, the reason we want to go PG-13 is because every filmmaker is creating a message and there's no what's the point of creating a message to 18 and over because that generation's already gone you want to create a message that's going to continue on so you want to create a message that everybody can that the parents can go you know what this message is good to their children continue this message on that then the children will grow with that message and then will evolve as a society to who knows this is, hopefully this isn't this isn't screwing up your whole format here. But I want to tell you one other thing too that that strikes me. Another idea is that you know I I, I love cinema. It's 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 the greatest form of mass communication or greatest mass communication art form, in my opinion. I mean television is related directly, but this idea of 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 stories that can be enjoyed by everyone regardless of culture or background or language. But I was going to say that the one thing about uh, filmmaking related to the idea of messages and, and the age of the group you're, 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 uh, you're talking to, I, I would also warn people to think about this because in my mind, Disney, an amazingly talented place, geniuses in so many levels, Walt Disney being a genius and everybody 
up till now, John Lasseter, the whole, the whole, the whole bit, genius. Now they have Stan Lee yeah. stuff and then okay. George Lucas. Well, well exactly. They bought the rights to Star Wars, to all of Marvel. Yeah. In fact, I saw a really great analysis where they're talking about Paramount selling the rights to the Indiana Jones series, and this is an analysis of how Disney is cornering the market on, let's call it. Hollywood branding. In fact, once they have Indiana Jones, one of the few, there's only a few major categories of characters that they that they don't own. I mean, this is an exaggeration. DC, DC and then the Hanna Barbera. Yep. Okay, so, but Disney. It, anyway, the reason why I bring this up, they are extremely, in my mind, they are the best. Uh, let's call it image brand conscious uh, people in the entertainment world by far. They have the theme park idea, television, movies, uh, merchandise. They they really are so smart. But one of the cornerstones to their, in my opinion, one of the cornerstones to their entire marketing plan is they think of entertainment as a drug. Uh, now, now I'm, I don't want to get in trouble here, but that, so this is my this is my metaphor. They want to get you when you're too young to know better. That means you're a little kid and you're watching Disney animation, and then you're going to stay with them for life. You get hooked. Now, there is really something about that in terms of how entertainment is marketed and branded. It's just food for thought. Is I think Disney, are, they're, the, they're the smartest. They get you when you're young, and you love it and treasure it so much. As soon as your children are born, you get them hooked, too. And it's really this interesting dynamic. And that's a big part of the, the design of big blockbuster films. It's this whole idea, and, and, and again, you can see that in how Disney has moved with acquiring things like Star Wars and Marvel. So it's it's a, I don't know, I, 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 I love it, and, and I'm a fan of all this, but at the same time, I somehow worry about the, the stranglehold that this kind of thing has on the kind of movies that are made, and the kind of entertainment that people even have a chance to see. We have like more animators now that work as animation in animation, and we we hear that we have like a lot of demand and also a lot of offer. So the salaries are going a little down. I don't know. That's we, what we heard, and I, we want to uh, listen your opinion if you think that we're gonna have a lot of offer. Also, if we de if it, we develop Brazil and India and Europe, and maybe we're gonna have lots of people working animation, not much movies or demand to to do it. Do you think it's a, it's a can be a problem. Well, I think um, I think what's what's happening in, re in the regard of of the business of let's call it digital filmmaking or animation, computer animation, visual special effects, is that uh, traditionally uh, the 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 center of it all was let's call it Hollywood. Uh, but it's become much more of a global business and a global craft. And I think that computer animation and, and visual effects has matured as a, as a craft, as an art form. So there's people all over the world now who, who not only appreciate it, but understand it and, and, have, and have experience and talent in that regard. So the, the, the number of people around the world who, who are, uh, uh, you know, top class computer animators is much greater. Back when I started uh, doing this in the late 80s, um, the number of people that were you would call the top flight computer animators, or let's say the number of people who had actually animated a character in a major motion picture was under 100. I mean, probably far under 100, actually, at that yeah. time. Uh, well, the now, how many people have animated characters in major motion pictures? I mean, internationally released pictures. Oh, thousands, maybe even tens of thousands. May, may, I don't know, but it's a large number. So that's, that has had a big impact. However, I do believe that this, this craft or this art form is, is here to stay. And just like film cameras, film cine cameras are slowly fading and digital cine cameras are taking over. So you could say, oh, the craft of filmmaking is dying. No, it's just evolved. So now if you're a cinematographer, a DP, you better, you're going to know a lot about digital cameras. And maybe not as much about film cameras as you would 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, so I think that the, in terms of jobs, the number of jobs is, is going to be very, very large. In terms of competition, yes, there's competition all over the world. There's been computer animators in Brazil, computer animators in, in uh, China, computer animators in, in, uh, in India, in 
Africa, all over the world, because it's going to become an inherent craft in making any kind of entertainment. It's going to become an inherent craft in educational materials. I just think that digital uh, filmmaking or digital television techniques or digital animation techniques will be used in all media. So I think there's plenty of room, and I think that it's a great it's a great business for the future. And I also think that uh, uh, digital entertainment or digital crafts will become a very fundamental part of of all economics. I mean, even even at places like uh, companies like Google or companies like Facebook, they have entire groups that are involved with, let's call it, the design of elements that involve animation, whether or not they're full 3D. And all of these things will only grow and become more essential. Yeah. Like he said, basically, like he said, basically, is that for every animator or new animator you have, that means that's one more person that wants animation. And that person belongs to a family. That person is promoting animation to that family. So for every single person that wants to become an animator, you have to multiply that by five, knowing that that's five more people who are wanting animation. So this is all just going to evolve and become the mainstream of the future. So it's never going to be, there's too many of this or too many of that. It's going to sort itself out, and people are going to realize where they fit into the new future. Change that with Lion King. Well, now, but in my time, <laughs> well, in my time it was really, it was really uh, disappointing. And I think that uh, you're right about uh, the movies that have a big influence in the, in the childhood. And they, they actually, they use it in a way that they got what everybody wanted, the dream of all, all, every little kid, and then they used to sell movies and stuff. And then uh, now I, I see some movies that they are trying to make a bigger message as, how to interact in the world and be a better person and I hope that the, 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 the newborn now they have a different view of the future because I'm still waiting for my Prince Charming and to talk. Prince Charming's happen every five months. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's true. But I think it's a really nice point of view when you said that. Well thank you. Thank you. No, I think, you know, and I mean I I do have this weird point of view and, and, and sometimes I, I get I complain a little bit because I think these big companies and Disney's in my mind the 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 central genius but all the studios they're pretty smart about these things and so I love what they do because they make great movies and they're exciting we all love the movies we love the characters of the stories but also they tend to help shape how people see and view things and and it it does I do worry about that there's only five or six studios that uh, Hollywood studios and their impact on people around the world, around the whole world, no matter where you're from, is tremendous. I mean, everybody knows what the Terminator is. Everybody knows about Lord of the Rings. Everybody knows about, you know, superhero or Iron Man. These things are universal, and they, and they influence and affect people. I'll tell you a story. The first major motion picture I worked on was called The Abyss, and I made The Water Snake. And I remember thinking, oh, this is great. I worked so hard. I didn't sleep for days, and it was so difficult. And I did it, and I go home, and literally, about three months after the movie came out, I started getting letters. Somehow, somebody had read that I, because I did some interviews, and I, I remember one of my favorite ones was from an art, it was a high school art class in, in a city in France outside of Paris, I forget the name, and the teacher was so inspired, he took his whole class there, and afterwards, they all drew pictures that were inspired by the movie, and he sent me this whole package. And I, I began to really realize, the first time in my life, really, to really understand the power of this mass communication art form. It totally changed my thinking, I gotta say. And I worked on Terminator 2, the same thing happened. Then I would, I began doing more, I would go give talks at panels and things. And you begin to see the power that a mass communication form has like that. And so I get concerned that, that because it's a business, that the choices they make 
are, I mean, I think that they're responsible. I think that Disney tries to, to make movies that have good messages, that teach people, and particularly young kids, about things like the environment, teach them about right and wrong, teach them about the kind of problems everybody has. Because, you know, everybody, when they, as they grow older, are going to face these dilemmas. They're going to make mistakes. You know, they're going to do things that they feel bad about. And these movies try to teach them how to deal with those things and show them these through these stories. I do believe that they are trying their best. But at the same time, it's wrapped around in business. I got to make, you know, when, when you're a director and you're making a $100 million movie, they're letting you do that not because they like you. It's because they think you're going to make them hundreds of millions of dollars. That's why they're choosing you. And even though they want to guide the process, the studios do, to make them be 